Their hands touched, and in that instant, it happened. Get away from him right now. As soon as she shouted that, Sarah stared at her grandson as if she was seeing something terrifying. My son, John, was five years old, but this was the first time he was meeting his grandmother, Sarah. It was as if an electric current had passed through her. She quickly withdrew her hand. Of course, neither my husband nor I had any idea what was going on. What did she mean by get away from John? We had been looking forward to this meeting, so why would she say something so awful? Trying to remain calm, my husband asked for an explanation. Mom, what's going on? Did John do something? Don't you two feel anything? Ignoring our confusion, she said this with an eerie calmness. What was she talking about? She sighed briefly and then spoke again. Listen, this child is being targeted by a powerful malice. Powerful malice? My husband and I exchanged bewildered looks. Who could be harboring such malice? I can't think of anyone. As my mind spun in circles, my husband suddenly stood up. After a short while, he returned with his laptop in hand. Could it be this person? He opened a video on the laptop and placed it in front of Sarah. I thought it was unlikely she'd recognize anything from it, but her eyes widened in shock. That's them. That's the source of the malice. I'm certain of it. Then, Sarah began muttering something that made us even more uneasy. My name is Nancy. I run a bakery with my husband, Jason, and today, as usual, the shop is busy. Early in the morning, we make sandwiches, arrange freshly baked bread, and do a quick sweep in front of the store before opening. As soon as the doors open, customers come in, eager for the warm, freshly baked bread. While enjoying casual conversations and introducing our seasonal bread, customers smile and say things like, That looks delicious. We've gained a lot of regulars over time, and chatting with them always makes me happy. But once, I was just a customer, too, visiting this bakery regularly. Before I knew it, I found myself not only drawn to the bread but also to Jason, the owner. That's how we started dating and eventually decided to get married. When we got engaged, Jason told me, I need to tell you, I've been divorced once. When I quit my corporate job to open this bakery, my ex-wife and I split up. He said this in a strained voice, and I could sense how painful that memory was for him. She didn't want the financial instability. But I chose to follow my dream of owning my own shop. That's the kind of man he is. He warned me that there might be times when he would prioritize the shop over our family, that he might not always be available to help with raising kids. We talked a lot, struggled with those thoughts, but in the end, we decided to be together. Don't worry. We'll figure it out, and I'll make sure everything works. I smiled as I took his hand. After that, we visited his mother, Sarah, and got registered. Jason and I were so full of happiness, convinced that no matter what came our way, we could overcome it. Sarah, my mother-in-law, is elderly, yet she lives alone in the countryside far from where Jason and I live. According to Jason, Sarah has a strong spiritual sensitivity, and being around too many people exhausts her. I don't have any sense for things like spirits or the supernatural, so I don't really understand it. But as Sarah says, Sometimes, it's better not to be able to feel those things. 
That's why she prefers to live in nature, and both my husband and I respect her wish. Even if my body isn't near you, I'm always watching over you with my heart. That was one of her favorite sayings. It was a strange sentiment, but somehow, it gave me comfort and reassurance. The year after we got married, my husband and I were blessed with a baby boy, whom we named John. Watching him grow day by day brings us endless joy. I feel like I want to capture every little change in a photo. Though there's a bit of sadness in seeing him slowly become more independent, I know he'll keep growing just like this. By the time he turned five, he had become quite talkative. But sometimes, he would say strange things. For instance, he'd wave happily at people passing by and say, Bye-bye. But then, at the park, he said something odd to a person walking their dog. Hey, there's someone riding on you. Of course, no one was riding the dog, nor was there anyone else around. Another time, while we were at the supermarket during checkout, he looked at the cashier and asked, Who's on your back? The cashier was understandably confused and even seemed a little uncomfortable. His innocent smile only made things more unsettling for them. When I told Jason about this, he was shocked. Maybe he inherited my mom's gift. You mean it skipped a generation? Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't let him talk too much about it in public. Of course, it was impossible to control what he said at kindergarten, but we started encouraging him to zip your lips whenever we went out. Still, he was just a five-year-old, and there were limits to what we could do. Even though he's my own child, there's something mysterious about him. If he inherited your mom's ability, maybe we should ask her for advice? John and Sarah have never met in person. When he was born, a severe illness was sweeping across the U.S., making it impossible for us to visit. Now that things have calmed down, I've been thinking we should reach out to Sarah soon. Around the same time that we were worrying about John's unusual comments, there were also some changes at Jason's bakery. It wasn't that sales were picking up or that we were getting media inquiries. Sadly, we started seeing negative comments about the bakery on social media. People claimed the bread was soggy, the sandwiches smelled, or that the owner had a bad attitude. Even Jason was troubled by it. I always serve freshly baked bread, so why are they saying this? And was my attitude really that bad? He vented his frustration one night while sipping a cold beer. Whether it was because of the posts or not, fewer customers had started coming in. Of course, we had been using social media ourselves, posting about seasonal specials and running promotions, which had helped us build a customer base. But now, with these negative posts floating around, fewer people seemed interested in coming. In this era dominated by social media, customers sometimes trust what they rate online more than their own experiences. I don't think we'll lose all our customers overnight, but things aren't looking good, and we need to turn this around somehow. One day, while I was sweeping in front of the store and getting ready to open, I noticed a garbage bag had been left there. Puzzled, I picked it up. What's this? Hoping it wasn't something dangerous or toxic, I peeked inside. It was just regular household food waste. Why would someone leave a bag of garbage here? Who would do this? Nancy, what's wrong? Did something happen? Jason came over, noticing me frozen in place. I told him someone had dumped a bag of food waste in front of the store, and he looked confused for a moment. 
but then he shrugged it off, smiling. Don't worry about it. It's probably just a mistake. Here's how you deal with it. He tossed the bag into the large dumpster behind the shop. Was it really nothing to worry about, like Jason said? As I stared at the silent dumpster, I couldn't shake the feeling that something bad was coming. A week later, it happened again. This time, there were three bags, and the smell was awful. Even Jason frowned at the sight. As he threw the bags into the dumpster, he muttered, This isn't a trash dump. The garbage kept appearing, and just as we were growing frustrated, strange things started happening to John. He suddenly began waking up at night, crying, or trembling in fear. Mommy, I'm scared. He would get up in the middle of the night, come to me, and start crying. He'd never done this before. What could be causing it? Did you have a bad dream? He only shook his head, burying his face in my arms, sobbing quietly. Don't come near me. Go away. Both Jason and I stayed with John until he fell asleep that night. After he had calmed down and drifted off, Jason sat down with a beer, deep in thought, and finally said, If this keeps up, maybe we should file a report with the police. About the garbage? But we'd already thrown it away, and no one had seen who was leaving it. I doubted the police would do much without evidence. After talking it over, we decided to install a small security camera outside the store to monitor the situation. At the same time, fewer customers were coming in, likely due to the negative comments on social media. Sales were low, and Jason seemed worn down. I wasn't sure how to lift his spirits. The only thing keeping us afloat was the loyalty of our regular customers. Let's focus on the people who support us, not the ones trying to bring us down. Nancy. Your bread is the best in the world. Isn't that right? I gave him an encouraging pat on the shoulder. Yeah, you were right. All right, let's try something new. A brand new bread. Suddenly, Jason's gloom disappeared, replaced by the same enthusiasm he always had when coming up with new ideas for the bakery. His eyes sparkled, just like when we first met, and he would dream up all sorts of bread during our dates. Nostalgia flooded over me as I watched him jot down ideas for new recipes, the table in our living room covered with notes and sketches. It reminded me of the early days of our relationship, and I couldn't help but smile. As if mocking us, it happened. A week later, someone spray-painted graffiti on the store wall. It was a poorly drawn character I vaguely recognized, alongside the words terrible bread. Worse yet, it was done with paint, not something we could easily wash off. People passing by were just as shocked as we were clearly disturbed by the sight. Since the store faced a busy street, there were always people around during the day, but at night, the area was quiet. It seemed no one had witnessed the graffiti being done. Jason stood there, his lips tightly sealed, his expression dark. He clenched his fists, radiating frustration. Even if they hate my bread... There are things you can and can't do. The security camera had captured a figure, but the footage was too dark, and the angle wasn't right to see their face clearly. Jason filed a report with the police, determined to get to the bottom of it. I won't let them get away with this. Strangely enough, after that, 
the garbage dumping and graffiti stopped. Perhaps the vandal had noticed the security camera while spray painting and decided to quit. It was likely the same person responsible for the trash bags too. However, the online harassment didn't stop. A little while later, on one of our days off, Sarah called Jason. Hello? The store is closed today, right? Yeah, but why? I've been worried about you both. Is it alright if I come visit? Wait, what? Suddenly? Both Jason and I were surprised. It was the first time Sarah had ever asked to visit us. I just feel unusually worried for some reason. Though her reason was vague, we didn't mind. We told her it was fine, and Sarah took several trains to come see us. She arrived around 3 p.m., with a bright smile and some sweets in hand. It was the first time Sarah and John would meet. John wasn't usually shy, but he seemed hesitant around his grandmother. Perhaps he sensed something. Sarah beamed at John, her eyes crinkling with warmth. John, it's nice to meet you. I'm your grandma. John, acting as if she were a stranger, hid behind me, peeking out cautiously to watch her. We're meeting for the first time, aren't we? Oh, I brought a present. She smiled and offered him the sweets. Here you go. Some chocolate. When John saw the word chocolate on the package, his eyes lit up, and he eagerly reached for it with a happy ah. Because we had asked John to avoid talking in front of others, he had stopped speaking clearly around anyone but Jason and me. Now, that habit had surfaced in front of Sarah, too. I'm sorry, he doesn't speak much yet. I blurted out the same excuse I always used when explaining to others. I felt embarrassed and guilty, anticipating judgment. Wondering if she'd question why a five-year-old wasn't talking clearly yet, or what kind of parenting we were doing. But Sarah didn't seem to care at all. She handed the sweets to John with a gentle smile. The moment their hands touched, something happened. Sarah jerked her hand back as if she'd been shocked by an electric current. Get away from him now. She screamed, her eyes wide in fear, staring at John as though she'd seen something terrifying. Neither Jason nor I had any idea what was going on. Get away from John? What on earth did she mean? Hearing such words made me feel awful. Why would she say something like that? It seemed cruel. Despite my shock, I tried to stay calm and asked for an explanation. Mom, what's wrong? Did John do something? Don't you feel it? She said this, completely ignoring our confusion. Feel what? What were we supposed to sense? Of course, when we look at John, we feel joy. Pride in how much he's grown, happiness at having him with us. But clearly, Sarah was talking about something else. Perhaps she was referring to something spiritual, but neither Jason nor I had any idea what she meant. You two are lucky, you know that? She sighed and then said, Listen. This child is being targeted by a strong malice right now. Malice? Jason and I exchanged confused glances. Who could possibly hold malice toward John? I don't know all the details, but it's coming from a woman. I have no idea who that could be. It's like a curse. Are you sure you don't know? Who would hold such a grudge against us? Could it be someone from John's preschool? A fellow mom? 
I didn't want to believe it, but my mind raced with possibilities. As I was lost in thought, Jason suddenly stood up. When he returned, he was holding his laptop. Could it be this person? He opened the laptop in front of Sarah and clicked on a file. It was a saved video from the security cameras. He played the footage of the person spray-painting the graffiti. Sarah stared intently at the screen. The video was dark, and the person wore black clothes and a black cap, their features hard to distinguish. The figure seemed small, but it wasn't clear if they were female. I didn't think Sarah could tell much from such vague footage, but then she widened her eyes in shock. It's her. That's the one radiating malice. I'm sure of it. I stared at her, dumbfounded, as Sarah started muttering to herself. This person. It's Amy, isn't it? Amy? Her? Jason looked at Sarah, his face filled with disbelief. Who was Amy? She's my ex-wife. Why now, after all this time? Wait, how can you tell it's her? From this footage? I can feel it. Her energy. I felt like I had stepped into a TV drama. People really do say they can sense these things? I was so stunned I couldn't close my mouth. Sarah reached into her bag and pulled out a small sachet, handing it to John. A sweet fragrance filled the air. This is a charm. It'll repel the malice. Keep it with you, okay? I couldn't help but wonder if something like this could really work. But John held the sachet up to his eye level and nodded seriously, clutching it tightly. Afterward, we spent some time chatting with Sarah and having tea. Throughout it all, John remained silent, gripping the sachet like his life depended on it. In the days that followed, the situation took a sudden turn. Not long after Sarah's visit, we received a call from the police. The officer handling our case had identified the culprit behind the spray paint vandalism and the malicious posts on social media. Yes. I understand. Thank you. When he hung up, Jason slumped in his seat, looking defeated. It turns out, the culprit was Amy. Both Jason and I were shocked. Just as Sarah had said, the person caught on the security camera had indeed been Amy. But why would she harass our shop like that? According to what Jason had told me, Amy had remarried after their divorce, to a wealthy man with a well-established family. It made no sense why she'd hold any grudges against Jason or the bakery. I don't know either. We'll talk more tonight. Since the call came during the day, we focused on running the bakery, though I couldn't stop thinking about Amy. Could she be trying to tear our family apart? The thought crossed my mind more than once. Thankfully, serving customers helped distract me from these troubling thoughts. That evening, after John had gone to bed, Jason grabbed a cold beer and some edamame and began to share what he'd learned from the police. It turns out, Amy and her husband couldn't have kids. Amy had explained everything during the questioning. She had undergone fertility treatments, but nothing had worked. Tensions grew between her and her in-laws, who pressured her with comments like, when will you have kids, and you're a failure as a wife. Gradually, Amy lost her confidence, and the situation became unbearable for her. Amid all this, she heard from someone, likely a mutual friend, that Jason had remarried. Jason assumed that same friend had mentioned John as well. 
How can Jason be so happy while I'm suffering like this? Her bitterness grew, and that's when she started acting out, lashing out at Jason and our bakery out of sheer resentment. That's... That's just jealousy. I exclaimed. Could such a petty reason really drive someone to post hateful comments online and vandalize our shop with spray paint? The thought of someone harboring that much envy and hatred was frightening, yet I also felt a small pang of pity for her. Amy had probably wanted nothing more than to have children and live happily with her husband. In situations like this, it's not a matter of blame, having children is a matter beyond anyone's control. I feel sorry for her too, but we were still hurt by all of this. Cleaning off the graffiti and dealing with the damage to our reputation had cost us dearly. True to his word, Jason decided to file a formal claim for damages. John must have been scared too. He downed his beer in one gulp. It was true, John had been the target of Amy's malice and Sarah had even said it felt like a curse. I couldn't forgive Amy for that. If Sarah hadn't come, John might still be having trouble sleeping. Thanks to the charm, John had started sleeping soundly again, just like before. The faint sweet scent seemed to calm him. My only worry was whether Amy might try to retaliate or curse us again. When I brought it up to Sarah, she surprisingly laughed. You don't need to worry about that. What? Why not? Because when you curse someone, the curse comes back to you many times over. According to her, Amy would eventually face the consequences of her own actions, and there was no need to fear that John would be cursed again. Not being familiar with such things, I could only manage a simple, oh, in response. In any case, as long as John was safe, that was all that mattered. We found a trustworthy lawyer and filed a claim for damages against Amy. We had no idea how she would react. There was a chance the harassment and vandalism against the store would escalate. The thought of things getting worse than simple graffiti was terrifying. However, to our surprise, the compensation was paid swiftly. According to one of Jason's friends, Amy's husband and his family provided the money. It seems they acted quickly, perhaps afraid of the scandal damaging their reputation. Since then, there had been no more nasty posts on social media or any further pranks at the store. We were relieved. I also heard that Amy and her husband divorced shortly after the incident. Apparently, neither her husband nor his family could tolerate her behavior any longer. They couldn't forgive the fact that she had been harassing her ex-husband and his bakery. Not long after, Amy was hospitalized. It was unclear whether it was due to mental health issues or some other illness. I couldn't help but wonder if, as Sarah had said, some kind of curse had backfired on her. There's a saying that what goes around comes around, and this seemed like a perfect example of it. When you harbor resentment toward someone, it will eventually come back to you. Even someone like me, who couldn't sense spiritual things, started to believe that a little. Now, I try not to be so startled by my son's strange remarks and just listen. As for Sarah, she ended up moving in with us. Given her age, we were worried about her living alone. At first, she hesitated, but Jason and I managed to convince her. The first few days after moving in, she seemed unsettled, but within a week, she adjusted. I can't believe I'm living in a bakery with so many people coming and going. She had been nervous at first, 
but now she relaxes in the back of the shop. According to her, everyone here seems to be good people, and there's no bad energy. Thanks to that, she's been able to enjoy a peaceful life with us. Incidentally, Sarah had another hidden talent. She could predict the near future of people and animals she encountered. She said it was something like fortune-telling, based on the energy she could sense. I can see it if I try. She laughed like a witch when she said this. Oddly enough, whenever Sarah casually told something to one of our regular customers, it ended up coming true. Sarah, what exactly did you say to that customer? That girl in the suit, I told her she'd get a promotion soon, and she shouldn't quit her job. What? That girl was indeed one of our regulars, always buying sandwiches from us. I'd noticed she carried a bag full of documents, and her nails were always perfectly manicured. But recently, she had seemed down. A few days later, the same woman came skipping into the store, heading straight for Sarah. As it turned out, just as Sarah had said, she got a promotion. But that wasn't all. Another time, she said to a customer walking their dog, Your dog is suffering. You should take it to the vet. Although the customer seemed doubtful, the next day, their dog fell ill, and a serious condition was discovered. Both the owner and I were shocked. After several incidents like this, Sarah quietly became known as the fortune-telling grandmother and gained a bit of popularity. But I don't want too many people coming to me, so I'll only share what I see occasionally. Thus, Sarah's fortunes became a special perk for our regular customers. Partly because of this, the bakery's business picked up again. Jason started rolling out seasonal menu items from the ideas he'd been jotting down. Meanwhile, John had regained his energy and returned to being his talkative self. Having Sarah around to keep him company probably played a big role in that. Grandma, there's someone over there. As always, he would point to a seemingly empty spot. Sarah would respond to each of his observations, teaching him the difference between what was living and what wasn't. I think being with her has helped John start to control his ability to see things. He no longer points at empty spaces when we're out and about. Even the cashier at our usual supermarket now greets him with a smile. Seeing John happily chatting with everyone reassures Jason and me. I believe this simple, peaceful life will continue, and no matter what challenges arise, our family will face them together. How did you enjoy today's story? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next video.